I am human capital. I am the most valuable asset of my community, my workplace, and my nation. I generate wealth for myself and those with whom I choose to partner. I am actively shaping a productive and happy future for us all. Now, for those of you who don't know me, I probably just tripped a few BS meters out in the audience. And I wonder, though, had it been different had I walked out here and made the same bold claim but said, I am an entrepreneur, which I am. Or had I said, I am a doctor, or a teacher, or a plumber, or a retailer, or even I am a factory worker, would it have been a little bit easier to believe that I am part of the economic engine and the future of our community if I had put a job title with my claim? Now, there's problems with job titles. When we put a job title on ourselves, as George Crane reminded us, there is no future in any job. The future lies in the person who holds the job. I myself have had the dubious distinction of owning every one of these job titles that is on this, on this screen right now. However, every one of them is now obsolete. If you don't know what one of these titles is, it's because it is now obsolete. So now I am human capital. I am the intrinsic value that comes with my collective experience through the years with my education and what I can bring to the table and do in the future, not just the job title that I happen to hold at any given time. And I want to start a human capital revolution here in Muskegon. And I want you, Tedsters, to help me. In 1999, Peter Drucker said the most valuable asset of the 21st century institution would be its, whether it's a business or a non business, would be its knowledge workers and their productivity. In other words, their human capital. Now, you might be thinking, that's great. We're talking about knowledge workers. We're talking about our TED audience here. We're talking about people who are educated. But what about people who have grown up in other economic situations who haven't had privilege, the people who maybe are living trapped in poverty or trapped in, in systems where they do not have the same opportunity as those of us who are listening to me right now. Well, for those people, Nandan Nilakani of India, who was the billionaire founder of Infosys, one of the leaders of the Indian technology revolution, what he said was that when interviewed on The Daily Show, he was asked, we always viewed a country of a billion people as a detriment. And Nilakani said, yes, that's the big change. I think we saw it as a burden. Now we see it as human capital. Now, the term human capital does get a bum rap, and there's a reason for this. It's because business has picked up and co-opted the term human capital. And so people tend to associate that term with being just a cog in a machine, or as these quotes say, being a bean counter term. And it seems to be dehumanizing. But the problem is not with the term of human capital itself. The problem is with how the actions that go behind coming, calling somebody human capital. And when business calls us human capital and then behaves to us in a way that is dehumanizing, then we take and put that on that term. And it's building a major trust gap in how we are viewing what everything else that business tells us right now. Back when in the industrial age, businesses were formed under a command and control model that was based on, on a military model, actually. And in that day, they set up the side of the business that they said, this is the business. And the business is responsible for building things and making money. And 
people are messy, so we're going to create a department, we're going to call it personnel, and we're going to put everything having to do with people in the personnel department. So personnel brings the people into the organization, people, personnel keeps them from creating trouble and, follow, and following the regulations of the organization, and then when the organization needs to make more money, the organization automates or eliminates the people, and then personnel is responsible for ushering them out the door. At one point, somebody said that really this whole personnel thing is very dehumanizing. We need to do better. We can do better. Our people are our number one asset. In fact, our people are our human resources. So we created a department from personnel that we dubbed human resources. And human resources was made responsible for all of the rules and regulations for um, attracting the talent, bringing them in, making sure they followed the rules, and when the business was done, with, was done with them, downsizing them and ushering them out the door. And today, business is calling their people human capital. And guess how business, what business is doing? Except we call it right-sizing now. It's not that business doesn't know what to do with capital. When business has financial capital, it shows up as an asset when it's reported up at the boardroom, and business knows to invest that asset wisely. They know they have to spend money to make money, and they also know that when there's a downturn, to hold on to their assets and val their valued assets and hold on to them tightly. But when it comes to their human capital, they're reported up to the boardroom. Payroll is a liability. In fact, one of the greatest liabilities that a corporation or actually any organization has is its payroll. They stop investing, they automate, they eliminate, and they make across the board cuts. And we end up in the boardroom with there being these opposing forces of we have to increase profit, we have to reduce cost in order to appease shareholders. Even as I speak here, that is the conversation that's going on in the boardroom. And so we end up with headlines like these this week. Siemens cutting 15,000 jobs in a $6 billion dollar euro savings drive. Or Project K from Kellogg's also this week, where a Kellogg spokesperson said that the likely outcome of this global initiative would be that by 2017, they would have approximately 7% fewer employees globally than they have right now. And that is Kellogg's growth strategy for the next four years. I believe there's an assault right now on the triple bottom line, and it pains me greatly. Um, in 1993, I built my own small business on a knowledge economy business model. We have been a roughly more or less a human capital alliance. We have a core team with others who we bring in as we can build opportunity and then disband as we, uh, as we need to move on to new opportunity. We are a co-op of shared resources with pooled overhead for economies of scale. We are an economy of more. The more we negotiate, the more we can collectively earn. The more billable people we put to work, the more we can collectively earn. And the more rare and valued our collective skills, the more we collectively earn. We are an economy of agility. Sometimes I lead, sometimes I create, sometimes I co-create, sometimes I support, sometimes I clean the restrooms. But I am free agent human capital within my own organization. You too are human capital. You are the sum and the potential of everything you have learned and done up until this moment in time. But saying so does not mean living it as we've seen. And so I'm going to ask you now, will you accept the human capital challenge, Muskegon? Will you come along with me and create a human capital revolution here in our community? I ask that you think of and promote the idea of abundance. Instead of asking, what will we do with all of these people, ask, what can we accomplish with all of these people.
be a positive deviant at work. Ask, why do we do it this way? When somebody says, do this, do that, and you don't have what you need, go to somebody else who's in another department or in another part of the organization or even outside of your organization and ask, how can we accomplish this together? How can we pool our resources? What can we do? Because these silos that we have created are only in our minds. Be a positive deviant at school. Ask, how does what we are teaching, how does this core curriculum prepare our children for the future of work, which will look much more like how I work today. And then demand entrepreneurship curriculum because entrepreneurship is the model that is closest to the model of the future of work. Seek human capital partners. Don't look for your next job. Ask yourself first, how do I want to work? What assets are available to me? What alliances can I form to help me get there? And last and much more difficult, most difficult of all, bring others along because these command and control models, perceptions, behaviors, they're very, very deeply ingrained in all of us. We grew up with them. They're in our schools. They're in our institutions. They're in our workplace. They are everywhere. And Changing that mindset is not something that can happen overnight or even with one small win. It takes many, many steps forward and steps back along the way. So when somebody says, yes, we tried that before, say, so what? Did you try it today? Did you try it with these people? Did you try it in this particular time in history in this space? Because I will tell you, I don't know about you, but for me, the things I have available to me today are very different than they were one year ago. We can't wait for them to do something. The big companies are not building the jobs of the future. They won't. We have to. So if you're ready to come along with me, I ask you to follow as I say this. Muskegon, I am human capital. I am the most valuable asset of my community, my workplace, and my nation. I generate wealth for myself and with those with whom I choose to partner. I am actively shaping a productive and happy future for us all. Go forth, Muskegon, reinvent work, be human capital. Thank you.